knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. With the general characteristics of annelids understood, let's get into some more detail, starting with the class Polychaeta. The term Polychaeta, or polychaete, is used to refer to any of 80 or so morphologically distinct families of worms. Though many of these groups were once thought to be closely related, more recent analyses have revealed this is not the case. Thus, the term is merely descriptive. It no longer refers to specific evolutionary history. It is primarily used to refer to marine segmented worms with a great deal of setae, like the fireworms. We will use this term when appropriate, but we will typically use the more descriptive term, marine segmented worms, to refer to the majority of the annelids outside of clade Clytolata. Let's look at this cladogram in a bit more detail before going any further. It's important to note that this cladogram is a reconstruction of a widely accepted diagram in the 18th edition of the Integrated Principles of Zoology from 2020. It is not universally accepted, but that isn't to say it's wrong. Rather, this is a simplification of the diversity contained within the phylum Annelida. The term polychaeta largely refers to animals within the group Errantia and members of Sedentaria outside of Clytolata. They include a staggering variety of marine segmented worms found in some of the most extreme marine environments on Earth. Some of them, like the gossamer worms, spend their entire lives swimming in the water column, while others, like the giant tube worms, survive near hydrothermal vents. Still others, like the Christmas tree worms, are filter feeders that inhabit coral reefs, while others, like the bobbit worms or sand strikers, sit and wait in their burrows for passing prey. Heading back to our cladogram, let's cover the marine members of phylum Annelida by going over Sipuncula, then Chetopteridae, then Errantia, and finally the marine members of Sedentaria. Members of class Sipuncula are commonly known as peanut worms. They were once considered their own phylum, but more recent molecular work has confirmed their position as highly derived members of phylum Annelida, even though all extant species are now unsegmented. They are all benthic species, meaning they live on the ocean floor, from the coastal intertidal zone to more than 5,000 meters below sea level. They are primarily sedentary, living their lives in burrows, snail shells, or cervices. They get the name peanut worm because when frightened, they contract their body into a shape that somewhat resembles a peanut. They are relatively small animals, most of which are under 10 centimeters. When feeding, they extend their retractable proboscis, which is surrounded by a crown of mucus-covered ciliated tentacles, and feed on passing food particles or detritus. Captured food is moved into the mouth through the esophagus and into the intestine for digestion. Indigestible bits are expelled through the anus. Chetopteridae, sometimes called parchment worms, are now considered to be some of the most basal and ancient members of Annelida. They are filter-feeding benthic worms that live in U-shaped tubes or tunnels buried in the sediment or hard substrate of marine environments. They get the name parchment worms because of the tubes they construct that superficially resemble and apparently feel like parchment. Though their tubes may seem unimpressive, the animals themselves have a truly unique body plan. They are highly adapted to their tubes and come in a range of forms. They are segmented and regionally specialized, with highly modified appendages on different segments for forming the tunnel, feeding, or creating suction for the flow of water through the tube. They are segmented and divided into anterior, middle, and posterior body sections. The anterior section contains the mouth and sensory antennae, while the middle section contains highly modified wing-like parapodia that secrete and support a mucus net that the animal utilizes in suspension feeding. The middle section includes the mucus net and fan-like structures that beat rhythmically in order to cause a current so that food moves into the tube. The posterior section contains repeating body segments that can be regenerated if damaged. Moving on, let's look at Errantia. These are considered to be mobile segmented worms, hence the name Errantia, which comes from an archaic literary term, errant, that refers to traveling for adventure. Sedentaria, meanwhile, contains polychaetes and oligochaetes that live in tubes and burrows. Errantia includes the setae-covered carnivorous sea mice, 
the predatory sandworms, or king ragworms, which are real animals first discovered and named in 1835, long before the sandworms of the book Dune, as well as a wide range of truly bizarre free-swimming forms that roam the deep seas. A few other commonly mentioned members are the scale worms, which are active hunters, and some of the most diverse, abundant, and widespread polychaetes, and then the poisonous fireworms, some of which are bioluminescent. Though most species of Erantia are considered harmless, the fireworms can be a major nuisance. Not only are they poisonous, but their hollow, brittle setae break off when touched, causing major irritation. They also feed on corals and have been known to devastate coral reefs, both in the wild and in captivity. As one might notice from these examples, most errant polychaetes have paired appendages known as parapodia that contain many setae, which are usually arranged in bundles. They are usually predators or scavengers. Their digestive system consists of a foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut. Muscular jaws, when present, are made from cuticular protein. Errant polychaetes have diverse circulatory and respiratory structures. Some species have gills that attach directly to parapodia, while other species have no special organs for respiration and gas exchange simply occurs passively across the body surface. In many species, the circulatory system consists of dorsal and ventral blood vessels that are squeezed to pump blood. Others have greatly reduced circulatory systems. Their nervous system consists of dorsal cerebral ganglia and a double central nerve cord. Sense organs are often highly developed and include eyes, complete with photoreceptor cells. Members of family Alciopidae have some of the most developed eyes of any annelid which are comparable to cephalopod eyes and include a cornea, lens, retinas, and retinal pigments. Most species also have chemoreceptive sensory pits which act as a sense of smell. Most errant polychaetes have no permanent sex organs, though each individual will often only grow the sex organs of a single sex. Typically, gametes form as temporary swellings that simply release sperm or eggs into the water column. Some species have a unique form of reproduction that involves the creation of a completely new reproductive individual known as an epitoke. Polychaetes capable of epitoki live most of the year as sexually immature animals known as atokes. Let's take the Atlantic pololo worm as an example. They live in burrows around coral reefs and are usually solitary. When the swarming period begins, the atoke produces new individual epitokes, the reproductive individuals whose bodies contain mainly gametes, or sperm and eggs. Again, each atoke will only create epitokes of one sex. The epitokes break off all at once and swim to the surface so that just before sunrise, the sea is covered with them. Then, just at sunrise, they burst, freeing eggs and sperm that fertilize in the water column. Meanwhile, the atoke continues to survive under the sea and begins to generate new epitokes for the next spawning swarm. Now let's take a look back at our cladogram. The last major group of annelids is Sedentaria. Notice that this group contains both marine, terrestrial, and freshwater segmented worms. In this tutorial, we will cover only the marine or polychaete forms. The largest family of sedentary polychaetes is Sibaglinidae, which includes the aforementioned giant tube worms, also known as beard worms, or Pogonophorans, which used to be considered a separate phylum. They live on the ocean floor from depths of 100 to 10,000 meters and are largely sessile animals that secrete long chitinous tubes in which they live. They are noted for their mutualistic association with chemotrophic bacteria that oxidize hydrogen sulfide to provide organic compounds from carbon dioxide. Beard worms house the bacterial symbionts in an organ called a trophosome. Other sedentary tube worms are particle feeders that use cilia or mucus to trap planktonic food particles. Some, like amphitrite, protrude their heads and extend long feeding tentacles to find food. Others, like the lugworms, force water to flow through their burrows. Still others, like the fan worms or feather duster worms, are common in shallow tropical waters and feed by drawing food through their feathery-looking radioles. Still others, like the bone-eating zombie worms of genus Osidax, burrow into whale bones to feed on enclosed fats. 
The last sedentary group of polychaetes we will cover are the acurans, or spoonworms, that were also once considered to be a separate phylum. They are found in all oceans, but most commonly in warmer waters. They are cylindrical with a long, flattened, extensible proboscis, which cannot be fully retracted. Most live buried in the sand or tucked away in a rocky crevasse, with proboscis extended, searching or waiting for food. Most species also exhibit sexual dimorphism, where the female is often much larger. In some species, like those of genus Bonellia, the male is considerably smaller than the female and lives on or in her body. So that's it for the polychaetes, but we still have a lot to cover in phylum Annelida. Let's move forward and go over Lumbricina and Hirudinia, the earthworms and leeches. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com. Thank you.